I mean, we went into this essentially because the boss said, look into it. You do what the boss says. And the church had always said, there's just one or two bad priests out there. It's an isolated problem. This is Sasha Pfeiffer, a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, best known for her work with the Spotlight team run by the Boston Globe. We thought, okay, we've heard there may be six or seven. And then suddenly we thought, could there be a dozen? And then we seem to have 20. And by the time we were confident publishing our first story about the scale of the problem, we said there were at least 70. We now know there were hundreds in the Boston Archdiocese alone. And it's replicated in almost every diocese across the country and around the world where people have gotten into the file cabinets of the church. So it was a gradual realization of how, how gigantic the problem was. In early 2002, the Boston Globe published results of an investigation that led to the criminal prosecutions of five Roman Catholic priests and placed the sexual abuse of minors by Catholic clergy into the national spotlight. Subsequent investigations and allegations revealed a pattern of sexual abuse and cover-ups in a number of geographical areas across the United States. What had first appeared to be a few isolated cases of abuse became a nationwide scandal. Then, a global crisis for the Roman Catholic Church. In 2015, the movie Spotlight was released, based on a series of stories from the investigative team that broke the news. It won the Oscar for Best Picture. It's time, Robbie! It's time! They knew, and they let it happen to kids! Okay? It could have been you. It could have been me. It could have been any of us. We gotta nail these scumbags. We gotta show people that nobody could get away with this. Not a priest or a cardinal or a freaking pope. I remember a conversation I had with a nominally Catholic coworker in 2002 or 2003, right around the time the story had broken and the scale of the crisis was growing to staggering proportions. When the scandal came up in conversation, she told me I was lucky to be part of a Protestant congregation where there wasn't a requirement for priestly celibacy because that was the reason that sexual abuse had become so widespread in the Catholic Church. A lot of Protestant Christians probably believed that explanation at the time. As the years went by, the scandal of sex abuse, the unbearable weight that came from story after story of spiritual shepherds abusing their authority and preying on sheep, grew heavier and heavier as stories came to light in other churches and organizations. In 2018, an investigation by the Fort Worth Star-Telegram focused on independent Baptists and discovered 400 allegations against 168 leaders spanning almost 200 churches and institutions. That was a moment for me when the crisis had a face. One of my son's friends had been the victim of an independent Baptist pastor. That man is currently in jail for having abused at least eight children over a 20-year span of time. And then the day of reckoning came to the Southern Baptist Convention. We thought this was a Roman Catholic problem. When people said that evangelicals had a similar crisis coming, it didn't seem plausible, even to me. That's Albert Moeller, president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, commenting on the Houston Chronicles report from 2018 that revealed hundreds of accounts of sexual abuse in Southern Baptist churches and the ease with which pastor predators were able to move from one church to another. I have been president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary for 25 years. I didn't see this coming. I was wrong. The judgment of God has come. Judgment has now come to the house of the Southern Baptist Convention. The terrible swift sword of public humiliation has come with a vengeance. There can be no doubt that this story is not yet over. In 2022, in response to a decision by the messengers nearly a year before, the Southern Baptist Convention's Sex Abuse Task Force released a 288-page report that showed some convention leaders more preoccupied with protecting the institution from lawsuits than keeping sexual predators from moving quietly from one church to another. One of the most frustrating elements of that report was the revelation of correspondence in March 2007. Father Thomas Doyle, a priest and canon lawyer who first warned of the looming Catholic sex abuse crisis reached out to SBC leaders. He expressed concern that the Southern Baptist Convention could be slipping into some of the same patterns as Catholic leaders who did a poor job in handling clergy sex abuse. And he urged Southern Baptists to learn from Catholic mistakes and take action early on 
to implement structural reforms so as to make children safer. Father Doyle says the response he got was dismissive. Another example of the all-too-human tendency to place the needs of the institution before our Christian obligations. When you read that report and to read accounts of people who were brave enough to call in to the executive committee to report abuse, for them to be ignored... That's not a strong enough word. We didn't just ignore them. Sometimes we impugn their motives. Sometimes we attack them. The reason why I'm president of the Southern Baptist Convention is because our churches do not agree with that and have taken action to correct those things. That's Bart Barber, president of the Southern Baptist Convention, in an interview earlier this year with Anderson Cooper on 60 Minutes. I have strong feelings about this. I'm, it's not just anger, although I'm angry about it. God called me to be a pastor when I was 11. I believe in this. For people to sully this hurts me. I'm not doing this to try to accomplish some PR objective for us. I'm doing this because I want to serve God well. The stories are sickening. Young girls and boys, abused in different ways and in different times, repeatedly, by pastors or youth pastors or music ministers who were able to move from flock to flock. It's not just a Catholic problem or a Southern Baptist problem or even just an American problem. Multiple denominations and churches, such as Hillsong, the Anglican Church of North America, even churches that do not affiliate with a denomination, all around the world have been racked with scandal as sexual abuse has come to light in recent years. The stain of sexual abuse is one of the biggest reasons the church faces a crisis of credibility today. There's mold in the house of the Lord. And with righteous anger and determination, we've got to say, this rot must be removed. I'm Trevin Wax, Vice President of Research and Resource Development at the North American Mission Board. You're listening to Reconstructing Faith, In this series, we address the church's credibility crisis, reflecting on the challenges of today while learning from church history and the church around the world. I hope you'll join me on this journey and consider what you can contribute to the task of restoring and rebuilding the church's witness so that the world would experience the majesty of Jesus. This is Episode 8, The Stain. The sex abuse crisis that has rocked the church worldwide is an apocalypse, a revelation of rot that rivals anything the church has seen in other times in history. When we look back in time, we can find dark moments, like when the church aligned with imperial power and some soldiers wielded the sword, massacring civilians in the name of the Lord. There were dark moments when greed and corruption led priests and bishops to give their blessing to injustice, to the fleecing of illiterate peasants in the centuries leading up to the Reformation, as people desperate to rescue their relatives from purgatory gave what they could from their meager savings and funded the lavish and opulent churches and palaces of higher-ups in the church. There were dark moments when Christians colluded with racial classifications in society, creating a caste system that propped up an unjust economic structure. At times, Christians have found ways to justify great evil, to defend the indefensible. But in these same dark times, there were always Christians who recognized the melody of Christianity was being mangled. Believers who committed to call out these atrocities as evil, to make amends, and to rebuild and restore the witness of God's people. Christians were the ones who challenged corruption, violence, greed, and slavery. 
Christians were the ones who looked at the church in all of its messiness and said, with God's help, we will wipe away this stain. When we fail to serve the abused and oppressed, we fail to follow our head. A body that does not follow its head is a sick body. This is Diane Langberg, a leading Christian psychologist in a video curriculum called Becoming a Church That Cares Well for the Abused. When we turn from those who have been abused, in our midst or elsewhere, we have chosen to value something else more than love and obedience to God. We are called by God to care for those who are afflicted and needy, to tend broken hearts, and to release the captives. Such Christ-like work not only brings hope and healing to the abused, our loving obedience to God in this arena is also transformative in our lives as we become more like Jesus Christ. Abuse has flourished in multiple church traditions and in many parts of the world. This is not an American problem. It's not only a contemporary problem, it's not a polity problem. Jesus said that anyone who would harm the least of these would be better off with a millstone at the bottom of the sea. If Jesus turned over tables because the temple leaders had turned the house of prayer for the nations into a den of thieves and robbers, it's hard to imagine him giving a lesser response to so-called shepherds preying on his precious sheep using their spiritual authority as a shield to evade detection. What does Reconstruction look like after the revelation of so much evil? Story after story reveals the deep stain of sex abuse. What can we do in the future? The problem is twofold. First, we have to get practical, to do whatever we can to implement policies and procedures that prevent abuse or make it much more rare in the church. And we must know how to respond when someone steps forward with an allegation. Secondly, we've got to get better at caring and responding. Deepak Reju is a pastor who has written a book called On Guard, Preventing and Responding to Child Abuse at Church. I asked Deepak to point out some of the false assumptions that can hinder us from recognizing patterns or signs that abuse may be taking place. It'll never happen to us. So bad bad things like abuse happen to other people or on the news, but it just won't happen in my home, in my youth group, in my church, or in my community. That That's the sad assumption that a lot of people make. Or sexual predators are monsters. They're not anything like us. So we, we assume that they're some kind of crazy person with all kinds of crazy problems, and they're not anything like the typical person that walks into church on a Sunday who is oc- occupying the pew on a Sunday. And yet, when you look at the, 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 difference, the different kinds of predators that have been thrown into prison, you begin to see they're not, not just people who are struggling with all kinds of problems. They're working-class professionals who are predators, who are just like my neighbors, who are sitting in the pew, just like the people sitting in the pews on Sunday. So they're, they're not some kind of freaky monster that we'll be able to identify walking down the street. They're people who are just like us, who are doing really horrific evil towards kids. A third one, uh, we know the people in our church, especially if you're in a small church community, like I grew up in a small church of 100 people. You have a more intimate family feel. You feel like you know everyone who's there, and yet the reality is you don't know the depth of everyone's life. You don't know them intimately in a way, but you know enough about them, you presume it wouldn't happen to our church. And then the the last one would just be, our church is safe for our kids. And yet, if you press into a lot of churches, you find they're doing a lot less than what we expect. And their standards are a lot less than what even the secular children organizations do in protecting children. I mean, what do you do in the situation though, like where, so let's say you, you screen someone and they've never, there's never been an offense before. There's never been anything that's been brought to light for someone. And so there are areas in which prevention, like a background check or screening is not going to necessarily keep someone who hasn't been caught before from, from, from doing something evil to, to uh, a young person in in the church. So knowing that, what are some warning signs 
that you should be looking for or you know some techniques of of sexual predators that we should be aware of just so that we can be like we don't rely on the background check to do all of the work for us so that, but we so we can be attuned to what might be taking place when it comes to techniques well first start with like grooming the church community Gro- grooming is, is the the habit of people living a double life they put on a certain kind of persona with with people a kind nice person that's likable is what they want to present in order to persuade you to give them access. And so they want to groom the community in order to convince the community that they're a respectable, likable person. But then the key thing within the community is they want to groom the gatekeepers. The people who make the decisions related to children or youth, those are the people they really want to convince to give them access to children. Once they get access to children, then they want to groom the children. So gifts, kindness, special attention are are, are particular grooming habits that predators will have in order to actually get the confidence of a child and earn their trust. And then they begin to break down barriers with those children. So physical barriers, starting with uh, touch, like tickling a kid or other things like that, which might seem innocent or normal, but there's a, they're, they're, they're moving along from innocent touch to more sexualized touch at some point where they begin to take risks to see what the kid would accept. Then they're also counting on no disclosure. Most kids won't speak up when they're going through abuse. They, they, and, and sadly, when kids do speak up, they're often not believed. And so they don't have incentive to go find out other adults who will listen to them because the adults that they shared with are, aren't actually believing them. And you have this dilemma because when a child says so-and-so adult is, is doing wrong things or wicked things to me, and yet that, that re- adult is a respectable member of the community in terms of everyone's vantage point, uh, it, it, you're holding that person's reputation up against this kid's uh, uh, recent information about how they've been abused. So that that's a hard dilemma to be in that a lot of people will find themselves. And then they're counting on privacy. In order for predators to abuse, they have to find isolation. They have to be alone with the kid. And so part of our, our strategy is going to be, for example, like we're not going to create spaces in our children's ministry that allows for isolation. Uh, overall, but that predators are counting on the ability to be able to be isolated with the child in order to commit evil acts. So you mentioned earlier that there are a lot of churches that are are not doing what what secular organizations that care for children are doing when it comes to preventing child sex abuse. So just hearing that and sort of sitting with that, I guess the question I would ask you then would be, I mean, what are some non-negotiable what are some things that every church should be doing in order to do the best job they can at preventing child sex abuse from taking place? The most bare and essential thing you have to do is you got to create and implement a child protection policy. Like that that sets basically a child protection policy that sets the parameters. It's a self-defined set of parameters within a church community in what a healthy and safe environment would be for kids. And self self-imposed as in we decide the parameters for our community, but once we decide it, then we will execute. We will make sure that we follow through with the guidelines. You get in more trouble with the law and with incidents if you actually set up parameters, but you don't actually follow through. So it's a, cu- to- it's a culture shaping aspect of this too. Like when yeah. you when yeah. you actually set the parameters and then decide we are going to live by this, you're it's creating a culture in the church that's already got the it's 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 something that is culture shaping for the church or the church church plant once you make that move. Yes, and it's uh, all three levels. It's not just the children's ministry staff, you know, raising the flag and sure. saying this is what we need. If you create a policy, you're you're if we take the steps that we did, we went through then the leadership and said, "Okay, do you see what we want to do? Do you, or do you sign off? Do you think this is a good thing for our church?" And the leadership gave us thumbs up. Yep, we're, we're behind you on this. We're, we're, we're advocating this kind of environment, this kind of safety for our kids. And then we took it to the church as a whole. We said, church, this is what we want for our children. 
Uh, but you got to have that dialogue on all three levels. Too many churches, the children's ministry folks are getting frustrated because they create something, but they haven't gotten a sign off from everybody else. And you can create a culture if everybody agrees. Um, and so it's, 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 uh, it's defining the parameters through a, a child protection policy is the most essential step you have to start with because you got to define the parameters for your own church community and get everyone then to sign off on that. I actually think church membership helps us in this in the sense of church membership establishes a commitment from someone to a local body, but it creates a screening process in us getting to know the person even before they join. So first one, child protection policy, second one, membership. I think those two are two essential ingredients. Everything else flows out of that. So, you know, having clear check-in and check-out process, a clear dividing line between when the parent's responsible and when the church is responsible um, overall, or screening and verification. Then the one that surprises people I throw in is building design. It's kind of a design that says you're not getting past this area. Only those who have been screened and approved uh, get past this area to work with our children. Uh, that, that would be another part. Then training staff and volunteers. So helping equip the leadership of the church, the, the general church staff, and then anyone who works with the children. So you equip the staff, the leaders, the volunteers, but then you want to equip the members, the, every, the parents. So we understand parents are the, the primary disciples of their kids. And so we want to equip the parents to know what to do um, in hard situations, how to get out ahead of this. But we want to equip them so then they can equip the kids and the teenagers also. The goal is to reduce the risk. Uh, we, we can't, in, in a fallen world, perfectly protect. But what we can do is we can make certain choices that does reduce the risk that is to our children in being submitted to any kind of abuse. The more I talked to Deepak, the more I realized that this kind of training and equipping is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing conversation. Every year, leaders in the church need a refresher on best practices for preventing abuse. As volunteers and leaders come and go, it's vital for everyone to be on the same page, to know what to look for and how to respond. If we want our churches to be places of refuge, places of safety that prioritize the welfare of children. If we want our churches to honor well the Savior who, against the cultural expectations of his time, said, let the little children come, we must not imagine that taking these kinds of measures are a distraction from the church's mission. We live in a fallen world, yes. Abuse will still occur, yes. But God forbid we shrug our shoulders and fail to do whatever we can to prevent such evil from happening. We'll be right back. I want to tell you about the New Churches podcast. This is a podcast that offers practical answers to real ministry questions. We aren't going to provide lofty pie-in-the-sky theories. Instead, we're going to help you in your real ministry context with your real thoughts, questions, and issues. Uh, New Churches features expert church planters and leaders like Ed Stetzer, Dahati Lewis, J.D. Greer, David Platt, and more. The topics include building a core team, preaching, reaching people, burnout, taking care of your family, and more. So I encourage you to go to newchurches.com to find out more. Yeah, it's been god awful. You know, when I was ordained, 1986, it was not on the radar screen at all. This is Bishop Robert Barron at an event hosted by Biola University, an evangelical institution on the West Coast, earlier this year. He is responding to a question about the sex abuse scandals in the Roman Catholic Church. 
It was in the early 90s in Chicago that it, it came on. And um, it's like a cloud. It's been like a cloud over my whole priesthood, practically. I mean, almost all the years I've been a priest, there's been this scandal. And it's, I called it in that book you referred to, The Devil's Masterpiece, because um, the devil, I, I, there's a story I've, I've told before, it's a true story. I'm at this conference, and um, I'm wandering around the area where the, where the books are, you know, and I forget why, but I was the only one there. And there's this lady behind the counter at this publisher, and she goes, oh, you're, um, you're Father Barron, aren't you? And I said, yeah. And she said, I, I like what you're doing. And she said, you know, the, the devil is very unhappy with you. And I said, well, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't like him much then, either, so. But then she said, and it's, it's still in my heart, she said, well, you know, he's a lot smarter than you are, and he's a lot more powerful than you are. Wow. And I said, yeah, I know, I know. But uh, he is. And the clergy sex abuse scandal is, is, is a masterpiece of wickedness because there's the original wickedness of the abuse of young people. But look at the way, the myriad ways it's undermined the church. In almost every way, it's undermined the work of the church. And so, you know, your friend, and like many others, who I'm, I'm gone because of that. You know, well, the devil is delighted with that. Um, so it's been a nightmare. It's been like this dark cloud. It's been a demonic masterpiece. So, you know, it's been um, a horrific nightmare yeah, for the yeah. church. The devil's masterpiece. That is a striking way to describe the problem and the fallout from the sex abuse crisis in the church. Virtually every aspect of the church's credibility is affected by these egregious evils. The good news in the midst of all this darkness is that we have the written Word of God and we have the Spirit of God. We are not left without resources to combat this massive evil. We are not alone in the battle. We see the unflinching portrayal of sin in the Scriptures, the depravity of humanity, the reality of false and selfish shepherds who prey on the sheep. And as we continue to deal with the fallout from the sex abuse crisis across the world, we have new resources at our disposal, better instruction, more wisdom on how to respond in ways that lead to protection, not self-preservation. When this happens next time, or to you and your church, you can be ready. Well, if I could say it in a short, memorable way, uh, if it's a minor report, if it's an adult support. This is Brad Hambrick. He is the pastor of counseling at the Summit Church in Durham, North Carolina, and a contributor to becoming a church that cares well for the abused. The basic policy is Romans 13, 1 through 6. Um, you know, we have governing officials. Uh, and so if we're asking, what does it mean when we become aware uh, of something that is criminal? Uh, that's I know that's not the way instinctually we think of it, but that's the reality of what is happening. Uh, and so if we're asking, we become aware uh, of a matter of sexual abuse, what are our Romans 13 responsibilities? One of the things that I hear occasionally these days from from pastors is they're they're really concerned about mishandling an allegation. Someone comes with something, and maybe they don't know the difference between what's criminal versus what's not. So, because you you mentioned earlier, if it's criminal, you got to report. If we're talking about abuse of a minor or whatnot, what if there's an allegation that's not criminal and yet sketchy, problematic? Like, what? How, how do you how do you help a church leader think through through that? Is that where they need outside eyes? Is that like what would you say? are some, some common areas that a church leader's instincts can lead them wrong in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one where sometimes we think if when we make the first phone call, we are filing charges, uh, as if legal papers are getting dropped at that moment. Uh, the way that I encourage pastors to think about calling CPS is you're getting an expert second opinion. Uh, you know, the threshold for making the phone call uh, to CPS uh, if you think there is abuse or neglect of a minor is reasonable suspicion. 
And so when you call, uh, you're not pressing charges. What you're doing is getting an expert second opinion. You're sharing what you know that raised the concern. um, And somebody who's done this for a long time, uh, they can ask you questions uh, about things that you may know that you didn't think were relevant, about concerns uh, or protective measures that were in place that um, they can take you through a structured interview process. Uh, And so that's I think that's one conception is pastors feel like they have to know uh, before they call. Uh, Also, pastors, so I'm talking as a pastor here, I'll talk first person plural, we. Before we get to a crisis, we need to build relationships with a law enforcement officer, with a social worker, with um, somebody who does investigations, so that when we have a question, um that we can call and say, help me think through this situation. Uh, And, uh, you know, at that point, their professional integrity of holding us accountable to if something like that happened, here is what you need to do. But us having somebody who who we know and trust to walk us through that, uh, we should be able to scroll through our phone find the number of a social worker, find the number of an attorney, a law enforcement officer, various people in those fields. Uh, And if we can't, as pastors, the first action step of any pastor listening to this is I need to find those people so that I've got somebody who knows this terrain that I can call when something I'm not sure about comes up. If you had to point to what you would say are the biggest mistakes that church leaders are most prone to make when an allegation of sexual abuse is brought to them? Yeah, I think one is we feel like we have to know. Like we have to know, no. We want to have all of the facts uh, before we move forward. Um, And sometimes we even take the idea of like, ah, you've got to have two or three witnesses. Well, sexual abuse just doesn't happen with two or three witnesses. Uh, The evidentiary process um, of a legal investigation, like if we're just thinking this through with some common sense, trying to apply the Bible, uh, then a rape kit uh, or the exam of a doctor, those are the second or third witness. And unless those steps are taken, uh, then somebody who has been harmed doesn't get that support. Um, the mistake of talking to the abuser before taking the next step. Um, you know, part of what we have to realize, I mean, if we're talking domestic violence or sexual abuse here, the most dangerous time in the life of a victim is when they initially come forward. Uh, because the abuser They have a strong vested interest in silence and nobody knowing. And so if you go to the abuser uh, and say, hey, we've heard this, is it true? You are making things imminently more dangerous uh, for the person who has already um, been harmed. Uh, I mean, if you think of it of like, oh, somebody stole my television, Um, you know, you don't want somebody from the church going, did you go steal their television? Because uh, Trevin told me that you stole their television. Well, that's a spot to go trash the evidence. It, uh, we wouldn't do this uh, with other types of infractions like that. Uh, And then um, if the victim is female, uh, not having another female involved in the process Um, like to have only men in the room talking with uh, a woman or a girl who's been abused um, is a mistake. Now, it's also a mistake to assume that only females get abused, like male victims. uh, This discussion tends to be a very pink discussion with the neglect of uh, blue victims. And so they're even like, you need to have a friend in the room. Uh, somebody who is there and their role is simply support, comfort, 
Um, they are a grounding influence for the person who's taken the step of courage and vulnerability to say, this is what happened to me. It happened in the context of the church. My church needs to know so other people don't get hurt. I mean, the reason victims come forward, this is one of those things that I feel like churches don't understand. They come forward to protect others. Invariably, if you have heard the story of victims coming forward, they do not come forward to punish. They are afraid of the person who abused them. They come forward to make sure this doesn't happen to anybody else. And so recognizing that courage and giving them a friend in the room with them is a huge spot of a huge way to honor that courage. I asked Brad to walk us through a situation in which a pastor or church leader makes some mistakes in their response and how those mistakes, while well-intentioned, can snowball into a cover-up. Often an early mistake leads to a later cover-up. Churches usually don't make mistakes because they ask the right question and get the wrong answer. They usually make mistakes because they don't see the important question. They get several weeks into caring, realize what they didn't do. They feel complicit. Then they start to do cover-up stuff to, to try to hide the things that they didn't know they should have done. Uh, and so there can be something that starts as an initial mistake, and then it becomes a cover-up for that reason. Brad, you you have a unique vantage point in that you've been reading about and learning about, speaking about this issue for several years now. Um, are you encouraged by what you see happening in evangelical churches across the country on this issue? Do you think that there's there's momentum in the in the right direction as far as getting better at at handling allegations and 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 knowing how to respond? Uh, when when things like this happen, do you, do you think the church in the next generation, and based on what you're seeing, do you think that we're likely to make some strides in the church being a safer place? So I walk into that question um, more from the vantage point of a victim than from a pastor, uh, and I think that as pastors is something we need to hear um, that. Even if the church's batting average is getting better, for every individual who entrusts their story for us, if we get it 70 per, right 70% of the time, there is still an immense fear of being in the 30%. Uh, and so are there things that I look at and say, this conversation is being had more openly? Uh, that there is in many sectors a willingness to uh, to be more humble and honest about our failures and shortcomings. Um, yes, there are those things. Are there also times when people are interpreting uh, victims being heard as a part of a culture war and they see this as something that's against the church and it gets narrated that way? Uh, yes, that happens too. Uh, no progress will go unpunished. Um and so um, as we think about it, uh, as a given pastor, we can say, I want to walk with integrity with every person who trusts me with their story, but I don't want to read my commitment to do that onto all of the churches out there. Uh, because there are places where this is being interpreted as part of a culture war and um, those who come forward with allegations of abuse are viewed as threats um, to be defended against, not as victims to be protected. Um, and you know, again, that tendency not to read our response onto all churches out there, uh, we can be encouraged uh, without being falsely optimistic. I asked Brad what he would say directly to pastors, and he had this word of encouragement. First word would be thank you. Uh, the fact that you're listening to this means the world to people who will come to you in the coming days and weeks. Uh, secondly, if 
If you don't already have a contact with a social worker, with a victim advocate, with folks who are in these spheres of influence, build those relationships now. The help that you need, you don't need to build those relationships mid-crisis because the crisis will shape those relationships. You need to establish yourself as a person of trust to them and them as a person of trust to you before you get to the middle of the crisis. Um, And as pastors, uh, being able to lead in the midst of our weakness and confusion um, and not assuming that we have to have the answers. You know, sometimes we think when people bring us the questions, that means we have to have the answers. Um, Sometimes when some people bring us the question, we take their hand in ours and we go to the person who knows more about this than we do. And the courage and integrity of that kind of leadership, um, it will change the lives of people who come to you in good ways uh, with stories of abuse. We'll be back in a moment. The church has lost its sense of wonder. We've become so familiar with the basics of the Christian faith that we find we're no longer captivated by the love of Jesus, that we take for granted what we believe. And that's when we start to drift toward new and innovative teachings that that seem attractive, that promise a jolt of energy. I hope that my new book, The Thrill of Orthodoxy, will reawaken in your heart an appreciation for biblical and historic Christianity that you'll experience the adventure of binding your heart to something ancient and enduring. It's the Christian faith. It outlasts all fads and fashions. I hope you'll check it out, The Thrill of Orthodoxy. How do we put this challenge in perspective? How do we respond in ways that bring healing and restoration out of a place of deep contrition and repentance? It will take determination and care if we are to be places of refuge, where accusations are taken seriously, and where caring well, both preventative measures and post-abuse revelations, takes place. In the first episode of this podcast, we included a clip from John Dixon, an Australian church leader and historian who, when asked about the darkest time in church history, pointed to today, the sex abuse crisis. I asked him about that answer. The primary one is the damage done to the people who were abused. But the thing that makes it so weird and dark is the lengths to which people went to cover it all up. Um, when, when we are meant to be the people whose instinct is to admit fault, like, I mean, doesn't every Christian every day of their life say, Lord, I'm not everything I should be. Please forgive me. Like that, that's sort of built in. And yet on this issue, we, we didn't, we, we, we hit it and. But, and but often right. out of a, a, a self-protective and church protective intention, I mean, I, because I, I think it would be easy for us to just completely villainize or castigate people who were involved in, in suppressing news about this or re- as if to say, you know, I, I would never have done that. And yet I, I look back and I, 
so I read some of these stories and you and you think about some of the people and the actions they took in in trying to suppress the news and you you could see how like logically rationally someone could get there because they're they're thinking I need to protect the credibility of the church and the way I protect the credibility of the church is not by lament and repentance and and exposing all of the rot but it's by Hiding it, covering it, minimizing it, trying to to make it there so that the exterior of the house looks okay, and yet it's scary to think about how easily self deceived we can be. Yeah, self deception is a uh, is a universal, and the the church isn't immune to it. Um, <clears throat> it, it. It. I mean, it's just incredibly lamentable that we have these built in structures in our in the in our convictions that ought to have led us ought to have led us to to repentance and to openness, bringing everything out into the light, um, and and yet didn't because we wanted to protect the name of Christ. But I mean, that, even that's a theological mistake. I mean, right? He doesn't need our protection. Um, Christ is the one who protects us. <laughs> like the gospel is our protection. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And and so, may, you know, those who were abused and whose um, violence. Uh, was covered up um, are obviously um, the the great victims here, and um, we need to think of them first. I don't have anything, you know. There's no defence. I've got nothing except I am so sorry that I am a leader in a in 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 a church that um, that has perpetrated this and and then covered it up. Um, and thank God that there are people who have been injured who are willing to forgive. And thank God that there are, um, you know, the vast majority of Christians who, who never participated in this, who are m- more shocked than the general public. Thank God that they're still clinging to Christ. But I understand full well that um, there are others looking on who just think, I could never go inside that building because they're the people who covered up such evil. I get it. Um, I, I don't know what to do with it. Um, just humbly admit the fault and try and bring the gospel to people. That's, that's really all I can do. This is a heavy note to end on, and we've only scratched the surface of what will be a lifelong response to this problem in our generation. But I hope we will be committed, not to expending energy in denial, blame shifting, and excuse making, but that we will walk the road of deep contrition, repentance, and renewal. Kyrie eleison, Lord, have mercy. Next time on Reconstructing Faith, The Silent Scandal, we discuss one of the major challenges to the Church's credibility, our quiet accommodation of Christianity to the American dream of pursuing comfort and prosperity. Years ago, I wrote a book on taking back your faith from the American dream. And in that book, I tried to expose how we're not called to take up a dream, we're called to take up a cross. And that fundamentally changes everything. And, and now, years later, having pastored in the capital of our country and seen some of the things we've seen over the last few years in our country, I'm convinced that deeper than an American dream, our hearts have actually been hijacked by an American gospel. Reconstructing Faith is a podcast powered by the North American Mission Board. In an upcoming episode, we plan to respond to comments or questions from listeners. You can participate by giving us feedback at resources at nam.net. That's resources at namb.net. If this podcast is helpful to you, 
it would be helpful to us if you'd leave a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening to and share it with your friends. You can find downloadable episode discussion guides to help you have good conversations about these topics. Find a link to each episode's discussion guide in the show notes on your preferred podcast platform or by visiting reconstructingfaithpodcast.com. Reconstructing Faith is written by Trevin Wax. Our show is produced and edited by Scott Slusher. Our sound design is composed, mixed, and mastered by Dan Phelps. Aaron Leslie handles audio editing and engineering. Story editing and consulting by Amy Simpson. Please check out my book, The Thrill of Orthodoxy, Rediscovering the Adventure of Christian Faith. Until next time.